Welcome back to the Easy Med channel where medical and science topics are made easy. In this video, we're going to talk about angiotensin II receptor blockers, also known as ARBs. And by the end of the video, you'll know their mechanism of action, example medications, indications, side effects, contraindications, and all sorts of mnemonics to remember it all. We're also going to do a quick review of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system because angiotensin II receptor blockers inhibit the normal physiology of that system. In a previous EasyMed video, we went through this chart and did a broad overview of the main antihypertensive classes. Now we're just going to focus on angiotensin II receptor blockers, but I wanted to make sure you knew about this chart so you could keep it with your notes. We also talked about ACE inhibitors in a previous video, and there are a lot of similarities between ACE inhibitors and ARBs. So I'm going to link this chart and the ACE inhibitor video down below in the description. Feel free to check those out. In order to better understand angiotensin II receptor blockers or ARBs, we need to know what angiotensin II is. Angiotensin II plays an important role in the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. Let's quickly review this system because angiotensin II receptor blockers are basically going to block the normal physiology of it. If you already watched the ACE inhibitor video, a lot of this should look familiar and be a good review. One of the main goals of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system is to regulate blood pressure and regulate blood volume, especially when blood pressure is low. Whenever there is decreased blood flow to the kidneys, the kidneys detect the decreased perfusion and they panic because they're afraid they're not receiving enough blood. So they release an enzyme called renin. Specifically, it's the juxtaglomerular cells or JG cells that secrete renin. You can think of renin and renal to help you remember that renin is released by the kidneys. The JG cells can also be activated by the sympathetic nervous system as well as decreased sodium levels in the distal tubule of the nephron and we're going to see why shortly. But first, let's figure out what renin does. Renin is an enzyme that plays an important role in converting a protein produced by the liver. This protein is called angiotensinogen. And you can remember this by using the gin and angiotensinogen to think of alcohol. And alcohol is metabolized by the liver. And this will help you remember that angiotensinogen is produced by the liver. What renin will do is it will cleave angiotensinogen to form angiotensin 1. However, it's angiotensin 2 that we need, not angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is simply the inactive precursor for angiotensin 2. So we need to be able to convert angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. There's another enzyme primarily located in the endothelium of blood vessels in the lungs, and this enzyme is called angiotensin converting enzyme, or ACE. When you think of ACE, think of air, and this will help you remember that one of the main locations of ACE is in the lungs. As the name suggests, angiotensin converting enzyme will convert angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 then has multiple effects on the body to increase blood pressure. Remember we said the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system is activated by decreased blood flow to the kidneys, so it makes sense that the goal of this system will be to increase blood pressure in order to better perfuse the kidneys. We also said the sympathetic nervous system can activate GG cells to release renin, and this makes sense too. Our sympathetic nervous system is involved in generating our fight-or-flight response. One of those responses is to increase blood pressure in order to better perfuse vital tissues and organs during dangerous or stressful situations. So the sympathetic nervous system will activate beta-1 receptors on JG cells, and this will cause renin release, which will activate the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, which will increase blood pressure. We also said decreased sodium levels in the distal tubule of the nephron can stimulate the JG cells to release renin, and let's take a look at why. Whenever there is decreased blood pressure or blood volume present, then there will be increased sodium and water reabsorption at the proximal tubule of the nephron in order to try to improve that blood pressure. So by the time we get to the distal tubule of the nephron, there will be decreased sodium levels because much of that sodium has already been reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. The macula densa cells of the distal tubule detect the low sodium levels, and they can stimulate the JG cells to release renin. This will activate the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, which will help increase blood pressure even more. Now let's take a look at the effects of angiotensin II and how it increases blood pressure, because knowing this will help us understand how angiotensin II receptor blockers work. If you already watched the ACE inhibitor video, this should be a good review. Angiotensin II has several mechanisms to increase blood pressure. The first thing to know is angiotensin II is a potent vasoconstrictor. There are angiotensin II receptors located on the smooth muscle cells of blood vessels. And just so you know, there are two main types of angiotensin II receptors, type 1 and type 2. It's mainly type 1 that we're referring to as we walk through this. 
When angiotensin II binds to these receptors, it causes the vascular smooth muscles to contract. Vascular smooth muscle contraction will lead to increased vasoconstriction. And if we reduce the diameter of the blood vessel, this will lead to increased systemic vascular resistance, also known as total peripheral resistance. We can see in the blood pressure equation that if we increase systemic vascular resistance, then we're going to increase blood pressure. The equation for blood pressure is technically cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance, with cardiac output also equaling heart rate times stroke volume. So for the purpose of this video, we're going to make the blood pressure equation heart rate times stroke volume times systemic vascular resistance. That way we're including all the variables. Angiotensin II also affects the kidney. First, it can directly stimulate sodium and water reabsorption at the proximal tubule of the nephron. If we reabsorb sodium and water from the kidney back into the bloodstream, this will increase blood volume. An increase in blood volume will increase stroke volume and cardiac output. And as we saw from the blood pressure equation, an increase in stroke volume will increase blood pressure. The other cool effect angiotensin II has is it can stimulate the release of aldosterone from the adrenal cortex. Aldosterone is a hormone that acts on the distal tubule of the nephron to increase sodium and water reabsorption. This will then have the same downstream effects of increasing blood volume, stroke volume, and blood pressure that we saw before. Aldosterone also increases potassium excretion in the urine, which will become important when we talk about the side effects and contraindications of ARBs. The final major effect angiotensin II has on the body is it can stimulate the release of antidiuretic hormone from the posterior pituitary gland. Antidiuretic hormone is also known as vasopressin. Antidiuretic hormone acts on the collecting duct of the tubule to facilitate water reabsorption. As we saw before, this will increase blood volume, which will increase stroke volume, which will increase blood pressure. There are also vasopressin receptors located on blood vessels, which will lead to smooth muscle contraction when activated. This will lead to increased vasoconstriction, increased systemic vascular resistance, and increased blood pressure. So you can start to see how this is all tying together. Well, we can tie this together even more. Remember we said the sympathetic nervous system can activate the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system by stimulating the JG cells to release renin. Well, angiotensin II can then go back and affect the sympathetic nervous system by increasing sympathetic outflow centrally. Angiotensin II can also stimulate the adrenal medulla to secrete epinephrine and norepinephrine, which are the main catecholamines of the sympathetic nervous system. So you can see how all the effects of angiotensin II connect together, and how angiotensin II has multiple mechanisms to increase blood pressure. Now let's take a look at how angiotensin II receptor blockers work by blocking the normal physiology of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. As the name suggests, angiotensin II receptor blockers are going to block angiotensin II receptors. We now know angiotensin II plays an important role in blood pressure regulation, especially to increase blood pressure. If we block angiotensin II receptors, then there will be a decrease in the effects of angiotensin II. The decrease in angiotensin II effects will lead to a decrease in blood pressure. We can also quickly see how ACE inhibitors work. Remember angiotensin converting enzyme, or ACE, is involved in converting angiotensin I into angiotensin II. If we block ACE with an ACE inhibitor, then we will decrease the production of angiotensin II, which will decrease blood pressure as well. If we go back to the effects of angiotensin II, we can see exactly how angiotensin II receptor blockers work by blocking the normal physiology. Angiotensin II normally binds to angiotensin II receptors on blood vessels, which causes smooth muscle contraction and vasoconstriction. If we block angiotensin II receptors on blood vessels with an angiotensin II receptor blocker, then we will have less vascular smooth muscle contraction and less vasoconstriction. Less vasoconstriction means the blood vessels have a larger diameter, which will decrease systemic vascular resistance. Decreased systemic vascular resistance leads to a decrease in blood pressure. We can also see similar effects on the kidneys. Normally, angiotensin II will increase sodium and water reabsorption in the proximal tubule of the nephron. Blocking angiotensin II receptors with an ARB means less sodium and water reabsorption, which will decrease blood volume, which will decrease stroke volume, which will decrease blood pressure. We also know angiotensin II stimulates aldosterone secretion from the adrenal cortex. Blocking angiotensin II receptors with an ARB means less aldosterone release, which means less sodium and water reabsorption in the distal tubule of the nephron. This too will decrease blood volume, stroke volume, and blood pressure. Remember we also said aldosterone increases potassium excretion in the urine. 
With less aldosterone, there will be less potassium excretion. This will become important in a bit when we talk about the side effects and contraindications to angiotensin II receptor blockers. We also know angiotensin II stimulates the release of antidiuretic hormone from the posterior pituitary gland. By blocking angiotensin II receptors with an ARB, we will have less antidiuretic hormone release. This will mean less water reabsorption in the collecting duct of the nephron, which will result in decreased blood volume, stroke volume, and blood pressure. Less antidiuretic hormone, also known as vasopressin, will also mean less binding to vasopressin receptors on blood vessels. This will lead to decreased smooth muscle contraction, decreased vasoconstriction, decreased systemic vascular resistance, and decreased blood pressure. Finally, we know angiotensin II augments sympathetic outflow and stimulates the adrenal medulla to secrete epinephrine and norepinephrine. Blocking angiotensin II receptors with an ARB will decrease sympathetic outflow augmentation and decrease stimulation of the adrenal medulla. So now we can see exactly how angiotensin II receptor blockers affect the normal physiology of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. Now I came up with a simple way to remember the main effects of angiotensin II receptor blockers, and it uses the mnemonic ARB. Angiotensin II receptor blockers have two main effects on the body. They decrease systemic vascular resistance, which you can remember with the R for resistance. They also decrease blood volume, which can be remembered with the B. ARBs accomplish these two effects by blocking angiotensin II, as well as decreasing the levels of aldosterone and antidiuretic hormone, which can all be remembered using the letter A. So again, the main effects of angiotensin II receptor blockers can be remembered using the mnemonic or acronym ARB. Angiotensin II receptor blockers will block the effects of angiotensin II, decrease aldosterone levels, and decrease antidiuretic hormone levels. In doing so, systemic vascular resistance and blood volume will be decreased. Let's take a look at some example angiotensin II receptor blockers. The easy way to remember ARBs is that most of their drug names end in sartan. Some examples include losartan, valsartan, candesartan, eprosartan, and olmosartan. Now that we know the mechanism of action of angiotensin II receptor blockers, let's take a look at some indications. If you already watched the ACE inhibitor video, you'll see that the indications between ACE inhibitors and ARBs is fairly similar, and this makes sense because their mechanism of action is similar. We know from before that angiotensin II receptor blockers have two main effects on the body. They decrease vasoconstriction, and they decrease sodium and water reabsorption in the kidneys. We know decreasing vasoconstriction decreases systemic vascular resistance, and decreasing sodium and water reabsorption will decrease blood volume, which will decrease stroke volume, which will decrease cardiac output. Remember our equation for blood pressure was cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance with cardiac output equaling heart rate times stroke volume. So it should be no surprise that if we decrease systemic vascular resistance and cardiac output, we're gonna decrease blood pressure. And this is exactly why ARBs can be used to treat hypertension or high blood pressure. Angiotensin II receptor blockers, just like ACE inhibitors, can also have important indications on the heart. Another way to think about systemic vascular resistance is afterload. Afterload is the amount of resistance the heart must overcome in order to pump blood forward. So if we decrease systemic vascular resistance, then we decrease the afterload because the heart doesn't have to work as hard to pump blood forward. Same thing on the other side. Another way to think of blood volume is preload. Preload is the amount of stretch in the heart before contraction which is influenced by the volume of blood returning to the heart. So if we decrease blood volume, then we decrease venous pressure and blood return to the heart, which will decrease preload. Vasodilation from ARBs can also dilate the veins, which can further reduce preload by decreasing venous pressure and decreasing blood return to the heart. By collectively decreasing afterload and preload, we decrease the oxygen demand on the heart, which reduces stress on the heart. And that's exactly why ARBs can be used in heart failure when the heart's already weak and will perform better under less stress. By decreasing afterload, we can help improve the ejection fraction in heart failure because there's less resistance the heart must overcome. By reducing preload, we can help decrease the pulmonary and systemic congestion and edema seen in heart failure because there's less venous pressure. By reducing afterload and preload, we decrease the oxygen demand on the heart, which is not only beneficial in heart failure, but also in coronary artery disease or after a myocardial infarction when it's really important to limit the stress on the heart. As a result, ARBs might be indicated in CAD or after an MI.
Usually ACE inhibitors are first line before ARBs for this indication, but it's also case dependent. All of the conditions we've talked about so far, including chronic hypertension, heart failure, CAD or recent MI, can all lead to changes in the size and shape of the heart called cardiac remodeling, and this can decrease the pumping function of the heart. Angiotensin II receptor blockers can help reduce cardiac remodeling from taking place by decreasing afterload, preload, and overall stress on the heart. Finally, ARBs can be used to reduce the progression of renal disease from chronic diabetes or hypertension called diabetic nephropathy and hypertensive nephropathy. Chronic hypertension and diabetes can progressively damage the kidneys, leading to proteinuria, worsening renal function, and development of chronic kidney disease. Inhibiting the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system with ARBs or ACE inhibitors has been shown to protect the kidneys and slow the progression of renal disease. We know that angiotensin II receptor blockers and ACE inhibitors have a lot of the same indications, but there are a couple differentiators. You might remember from the ACE inhibitor video that ACE inhibitors can cause cough or angioedema. This is mainly caused by increased bradykinin levels. Bradykinin is a peptide that has a couple effects on the body. First, it can cause bronchoconstriction in the lungs, which can lead to a cough. Bradykinin is also involved in inflammation. It causes vasodilation and increases vascular permeability, which can increase edema. It also increases pain perception. So how do ACE inhibitors play a role? Angiotensin-converting enzyme breaks down bradykinin, which leads to decreased bradykinin levels. And this makes sense because the goal of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system is to increase blood pressure. So we don't want to have bradykinin around because bradykinin causes vasodilation. Well, if we block ACE with an ACE inhibitor, we're now going to have less breakdown of bradykinin, which will result in higher levels of bradykinin, and this can cause increased cough and increased edema, known as angioedema. Well, if we look at angiotensin II receptor blockers, they don't involve ACE, so the bradykinin levels aren't going to be impacted as much. And this is why ARBs have a lower incidence of cough and angioedema compared to ACE inhibitors. Now there are some rare cases in which ARBs caused angioedema, and there could be some cross-reactivity between ACE inhibitors and ARBs. So if a patient has angioedema or cough from an ACE inhibitor, then the provider and patient will have to decide the risk and benefit of switching to an ARB versus switching to a completely different class of medicine depending on what they're treating. Let's move on to the side effects of angiotensin II receptor blockers. I came up with the mnemonic Losartan, which is a type of ARB, to make it easy for you to remember the main side effects. Losartan stands for low blood pressure, other which includes fatigue, headache, and dizziness. Then we have swelling, allergic reaction, raised potassium, teratogenic, acute kidney injury, and nasal congestion. The first side effect is low blood pressure, which makes sense because ARBs are used to treat hypertension. This is especially true when first starting an ARB or if someone is already taking multiple medications for their hypertension, so make sure to monitor blood pressure. Other includes general mild to moderate symptoms such as fatigue, headache, and dizziness. Swelling can also occur in the hands and feet, especially if there is acute kidney injury present from taking an ARB. We're going to talk more about this in a bit. The swelling is also there to remind you of angioedema. Again, angioedema is associated more with ACE inhibitors because of bradykinin, but there are rare cases of ARBs causing it too. Like many medications, there can be allergic reactions. Sometimes ARBs can cause a rash. The R stands for raised potassium known as hyperkalemia. Remember how we said angiotensin II stimulates aldosterone release and aldosterone increases potassium excretion in the urine. This means there will be lower levels of potassium in the blood. If we block aldosterone release with an angiotensin II receptor blocker, then less potassium will be excreted in the urine and there will be more potassium in the blood. The patient could have hyperkalemia as a result. ARBs have also been shown to be teratogenic and should be avoided in pregnancy. A stands for the acute kidney injury that can occur, especially when first starting an angiotensin II receptor blocker. Now we said earlier that ARBs are renal protective and they slow the progression of renal disease. However, if the patient already has an underlying condition causing poor perfusion to the kidneys, such as chronic kidney disease, polycystic kidney disease, or renal artery stenosis, then ARBs could be detrimental by decreasing renal perfusion even more. So it's important to monitor renal function closely when first starting an ARB, especially if there's any underlying kidney disease. Finally, N stands for nasal congestion. Angiotensin II receptor blockers can cause side effects to the upper airway, including the sinuses and nasopharynx.
This can lead to nasal congestion or drainage. Let's wrap this up with contraindications to ARBs, most of which we can piece together from the side effects and pathophysiology we already talked about. Although not a major contraindication, you want to be mindful if the patient is already taking other antihypertensive medications because adding an ARB could cause things like hypotension, orthostatic hypotension, dizziness or lightheadedness, or even syncope. If a patient has a prior history of angioedema or anaphylaxis from an ARB, then ARB should be avoided. If a patient had angioedema or anaphylaxis from an ACE inhibitor, use caution and careful consideration when thinking about switching to an ARB. Remember there are rare cases of angioedema with an ARB, and there's the possibility of cross-reactivity between ACE inhibitors and ARBs. Another contraindication, or at least a relative one, is hyperkalemia, especially if the patient is taking other medications that can raise potassium levels, or they have a diet rich in potassium, or they have any other underlying risk factors for developing hyperkalemia. As we know from before, ARBs can cause hyperkalemia by decreasing aldosterone levels. We also know ARBs can be teratogenic and should be avoided during pregnancy. And we also talked about how ARBs can cause renal injury, especially in someone who already has underlying kidney disease and poor renal perfusion to begin with. This is especially true in patients with bilateral renal artery stenosis. Giving an ARB to a patient with bilateral renal artery stenosis could decrease what little perfusion to the kidneys they already have, and it could make things worse. So again, make sure to use caution and closely monitor renal function in anyone with underlying kidney disease or anyone that's first starting an ARB. Hopefully this video helped you better understand angiotensin II receptor blockers. If it did, please hit that like button and comment down below. Also, please subscribe so you don't miss out on future videos that will help save you time in studying. As always, you can find the notes for this video on the EasyMed website, linked down below in the description, as well as other lectures and videos that make medicine easy. Thanks for watching and hope you check out future videos.